Welcome to the Pat White Show. Well, hello everyone. Welcome into episode 7 of the Pat White Show. Here's what we're covering on today's program. Paul Simon got a big hearing problem, and it ain't good, folks. And then the D.C. Swamp. What do we do about that? And, of course, Stroh's Beard. Does anybody remember Stroh's Beard? Well, I do. I don't tell you about that. Women are buying guns today like nobody has ever seen before. That's one of the topics. And, of course, the cheapest state to find a house. That's a kind of interesting topic, figure out where we are and buying a house. And how about this? California governor to decide the fate of the Menendez brothers. Yeah, that's the one you're going to love. And Bella Caroli has passed on at the age of 82. And here's another one. Trap teams, big thing in high schools. Your high school, do they have it? It's a big deal. I'll tell you about that. Drone fighting going on in Ukraine. It's the future of war, folks. And finally, a columnist at the Washington Post goes ugly early. That's all today, all on today's edition of the Pat White Show, right here, and you're watching it right now. If you're a fan of music that came out of the 1970s, that's a great ear for music, believe me. Some of the best music ever. Matter of fact, you hear it in commercials nowadays uh, for some of these major companies using the songs from that era. Well, one of the greatest recording groups or greatest recording artists back in those days was Simon and Garfunkel. Paul Simon, Art Garfunkel, Bridge Over Troubled Waters, and a whole lot more. Well, ultimately, they split up, and Paul Simon went on his own and did uh, some really, really great music. Well, Paul Simon is now 83 years of age, and unfortunately, Paul Simon is going deaf. He is losing his hearing, and now, well, he can't really play much simply because he can't hear what he's singing. The last uh, performance he did was over in Hawaii back in 2018, I believe it was. It was his final tour. He does some small stuff nowadays, plays clubs, small events, small things. He said, but one of his favorite songs was the one, You Can Call Me Hell. That was when he did kind of the African beat with a lot of stuff, Diamonds on the Soles of Her Shoes and, and all those other particular songs off of that album. But You Can Call Me Hell, and the video he did on MTV was with Chevy Chase. And obviously it's still a classic if you know anything about MTV videos, which they don't really do anymore. Now everything is, well, whatever MTV is doing. But it sounds now that Paul Simon... He's telling people, hey, you know what? I just can't hear. And if you can't hear, you can't sing because you really don't know what you're singing. You can't tell your tone. And that's the problem he's dealing with. And it just so happens that's, that's a fate to so many strong uh, groups that came out of the 60s and 70s. And I happen to be one of those baby boomer people, and I, I lived in that era. I knew the music of that era. And sometimes I find myself when I'm watching television and suddenly I hear a song and the latest one I've heard is one from the, uh, the Turtles, the old song Happy Together. I don't recall what company it was for. Could have been a detergent, could have been a car. I don't know. But you're standing there going, imagine me and you. That's what I was doing. And then another one I heard was, uh, was War, the old song Lowrider, but it was for a particular uh, medical problem, some sort of drug. Singing war? I don't know. But like I'm saying, a lot of the great stuff back in that era is now, well, long forgotten. Or the artists who sang it are getting old and are losing their faculties. And sadly, Paul Simon is going deaf and can no longer hear the music that he produced. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, you probably heard the term the swamp. That has to do with Washington, D.C. And uh, basically a swamp crawls with creatures of all sorts. The trouble is, how do you drain the swamp and kill off the creatures that are inhabited therein? Well, there's the problem. Donald Trump, when he first became president, appointed a bunch of people who he thought were going to be okay, and apparently they turned out to be nothing more than rhinos. And things didn't work out as well. Second time around, he's making appointments that, well, most Americans are familiar with. You know, Pam Bodney, the attorney general, hey, she was the attorney general down in Florida. She defended Trump when he was impeached. And a whole lot of other, Dr. Oz, the Kennedy, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Elon Musk. And uh, now it appears that uh, Pete Hegseth may be appointed to the, uh, the head of the uh, Department of Defense. And it goes on and on. So Trump is putting people in there he knows now to see if they can uh, clean up the swamp. But let me give you a little information. If you're wondering about who is part of the swamp, well, let's do it this way. Uh, let's start off with the, government, the governor of Michigan. You know that she used to work for George Soros? Yep. California Governor Gavin Newsom is Nancy Pelosi's nephew. But you didn't know that. Adam Schiff's sister is married to one of George Soros's sons. And John Kerry's daughter is married to a mullah's son in Iran. Keeps going. The ABC News executive producer Ian Cameron is married to Susan Rice. Remember Susan Rice? Obama's former um, uh, national security advisor? Yep. And ABC News correspondent uh, Claire Shipman is married to none other than, uh, uh, how about Jay Carney? He's the former uh, Obama White House press secretary. And he goes worse. Uh, ABC News and Univision, Univision sorry, reporter Matthew Jaffe is married to Kate Hogan, Obama's former deputy press secretary. Oh, I can go on. And for more, ABC President uh, uh, Ben Sherwood is the brother of Elizabeth Sherwood, who happens to be the Obama's former special advisor. Swamp gets pretty deep, doesn't it? And even CNN's VP Veronica Mosley is married to Tom H uh, Nidus, and Nidus is the former Hillary Clinton deputy secretary. It keeps going, folks. It just keeps going. That's what you call a stacked deck, okay? Just so you understand what we're getting into. If you had a hunch that the news media was... Uh, somewhat rigged, well, you wouldn't be putting your uh, finger in the wrong hole. No, because the news media is part of this. The news media is part of the cabal, the swamp. Can that be adjusted? Can that be opened up? Will real journalists come forward? It's anybody's guess. You heard what happened in Washington, D.C. At, uh, at the Washington Post, the people on there rebelling because they didn't like what, uh, what uh, Bezos did. So here's the problem. Trump's going to try to do his best, I believe that. But will he be able to drain the swamp when these are the kind of people that you're dealing with? It's incestuous. It doesn't get any better. It gets worse. And believe me, if I start telling you things about Kamala Harris and her husband and who he's connected with, you would sit there and go, you've got to be kidding. Nope. Runs pretty deep, folks. It runs very, very deep. Can the swamp be drained and the animals choked off? I don't know. Just telling you what I do know, and hopefully you'll understand. Well, class, welcome to History 101. The history is me. I'm going to tell you a little bit of something that maybe you don't know. I'm going clear back to the early, early 1970s. I realize that's a long time ago. But back then, I had just graduated from, uh, well, up pilot upgrade training is what they call it. I was stationed at, at Castle Air Force Base in Merced, California, flying the KC-135. Just finished my training, and I was driving across the United States to my new base where I was going in Kokomo, Indiana, a place called Grissom Air Force Base. Well, I packed up my, uh, my Chevy Malibu, bright red SS, had a ski rack on the back, my K2 comps on there because in California you're skiing, you're swimming, whatever. And loaded up a few cases of Coors beer because that's what I drank. And uh, drove across country. Drove into Indiana finally after, what, three days or whatever it took. 
And first thing I saw was a billboard that says, Welcome to Indiana, and it had Governor uh, Whitworth's name on it. And below it, on the billboard, someone had taken spray paint and said, Set your clocks back 100 years. Didn't know what that meant, but I soon learned. Well, anyway, I was flying at Grissom Air Force Base, the EC-135 looking glass, flying with the third axe back in those days. And uh, one of the things I was looking for is a place to ski. Well, apparently, you don't ski in Indiana. you got to go up to Boyne Highlands, six, seven hours away. Needless to say, I sold my skis. Well, anyway, one of the things I did coming to Indiana is I had my best friend in the entire world. He and I went to high school, college together, still best friends today. His name is Brian Kanoff. BK is one of the best professional photographers in the United States. Still is and still was. He's, he's excellent. Anyway, he was doing his master's work at Ball State University in Muncie. So I went up to see him and he said, hey, let's go to a bar. We went to a dive, whatever it was in Muncie. I remember going in and there was a big neon sign that said, Stroh's Bohemian Style Beer. Stroh's. Okay. Well, so there it was. And uh, I consume a bottle of Stroh's, actually more than one bottle, to be honest with you. But that's what I did. And uh, as a result of that, I suffered a, uh, rather in a big case of the Thai two-step. Call it what you will. You know what I'm talking about. But that was what I started to drink back in the old days. Well, now I have just discovered, looking on Facebook, there it is. There's a picture of a can of Stroh's, and I haven't seen Stroh's in a long, long time. Apparently, it's starting to make some sort of comeback. And that's really pretty cool when you think about it. Here's an old classic beer. And the old saying, everything old is new again. And maybe it is. So, if I happen to see a can of Stroh's out there, a six-pack of Stroh's, would I be inclined to buy it? Nah, wouldn't. I've already been there and done that. Don't need to do that anymore. But if you've never had the Stroh's Bohemian-style beer, it's different. It tastes a little bit different, and it ain't Coors. But Coors wasn't in Indiana back then, and I had to find a different way to import it. I did, and that's a t totally different story that I ain't getting to right now. But now you know. My first chance to uh, try out a local beer was Stroh's Bohemian-style beer back in the very early 1970s with my best friend and college friend and still best friend today, Brian Kanoff, and... That's my memory, Stroh's Bohemian Style Beer. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to take a few minutes to discuss shooting sports, because I happen to be actively involved in that. I'm a shooter, and I plain don't admit that. I'm not an animal shooter. I don't shoot deer, whatever. I'm a target shooter, and I shoot specifically special targets from ARA, which means the American Rimfire Association, and IBS targets, and you can see how those targets look. And the object is for us to shoot at a distance and shoot at something very, very small. And the better you are, well, the bigger you are, frankly, and that's what I enjoy shooting. But speaking of shooting, you know, we went through some discussions in the uh, recent presidential election where Kamala Harris was asked if she owned a gun, and she said, yes, she owns a Glock. I'm not going to dispute that. She's former district attorney, whatever. But if I were asking her a question, I'd have said, excuse me, ma'am, since you own a Glock, which model do you own? Because that would have told me a whole lot if she would have said, uh, well, I don't really know, or whatever. If she would give me a specific Glock, because all Glocks are different models. They have, I can't tell you how many different models they have, and each model represents a different caliber. Glock's 42, 43, 44. I got all those, 19, got that. So... Every Glock has a different caliber. And if she would have said, well, I own a Glock 26 or I own a Glock 19, I would have known, really, you shoot that caliber. That would have told me something. But nobody ever asked that question. But speaking of guns, here's something interesting. A new Gallup poll was just released a couple of days ago. It said women, okay, women are becoming gun owners more than ever before. And interestingly enough, the number of Democrat men Owning guns has now dropped. It's declining. According to the Gallup survey, and this is published uh, two days ago, the percentage of Republican female uh, gun owners has increased from 19% back in 
uh, 2007 to 2012 to 33% from 2019 to 2024. It has gone up dramatically. And I can tell you, as being a range safety officer, uh, we've got a lot of women that want to come out and shoot. And you go to a gun store and ask any federal firearm licensee who's buying guns, they'll tell you it's women. Women are buying guns to protect themselves. 22% of Republican women surveyed in 2013 to 2018 said they own guns. And that's a 50% increase in conservative women since uh, uh, they started to keep track of this stuff. Now, the rate for men, Democrat men, has fallen roughly 7% to 29%. So, Republican or Democrat men don't shoot. Republican men, well, a lot of us do. And we happen to enjoy what we're doing. The point I'm trying to tell you here is that more and more women are getting involved in this sport. There's shooting teams, there's special uh, sporting events. Uh, clubs have uh, special clubs for women to shoot and they're all learning to practice and train. So here's the big thing to remember. Safety is number one. If you're a woman who wants to get interested in owning a handgun and being able to shoot and protect yourself, make sure you go through an NRA certified course by NRA certified instructors. The life you save could be yours and protecting yourself is paramount. Just something to bring up and something for you to think about if you're interested in shooting. And that's all I can tell you as a member of the NRA and an NRA certified safety officer. Something to think about. See ya. If you're interested in buying a home, you might be thinking to yourself, I wonder if I'm living in a state that has really good home prices and I can actually afford to buy a home. Well, it turns out, there's a way you can find out. It's very interesting. It's called the home price to income ratio. Now, what that means is they uh, calculate by dividing the uh, medium home price in whatever state you live in, and they divide it by the medium household income. Now, that can vary by cities and states, but basically it gives you an idea what states are the most expensive and what states are the most or least expensive. Well, here's what they've done. They've figured it out that the most expensive state to buy a house in is Hawaii. Hawaii is, uh, uh, well, 8.4 and 8.4 in California as well. California and Hawaii, the two most expensive states to buy a house. The national average, in case you want to know, is 4.7. That's not dividing out the median price of the house, median income. Well, like I said, California is the most expensive. Hawaii is even worse than that. But the average in America is 4.7. Now, how does it fare out in individual states? Well, it turns out, if we take a look at the 50 states, Indiana ranks number 41. That ain't too bad, folks. 41 out of, uh, out of 50, not too terribly bad. Indiana has a rating of 3.5. Like I said, the national average is 4.7. Indiana is a 3.5. So who's got the cheapest housing in the uh, entire United States? It turns out it's West Virginia. West Virginia's average is 2.9. But you got to understand the median income in West Virginia is not that much. Median home price is not that much because, well, people can't afford that. So what we're learning is simple. If you want to know if you're living in the right state, you might say, well, great, uh, I can buy a house. I can afford to buy a house. A rule of thumb is simple. If you live on the West Coast, it's going to cost you a boatload of money. If you live on the East Coast, it's also going to cost you a boatload of money. But if you happen to live in the Midwest, we have the most medium price houses. We have the best uh, medium price houses in the United States. East and West, expensive as all get out. In the Midwest, we're actually reasonable. Like I said, Indiana, we're a 3.5. Ohio, 3.3. I don't want to mention Illinois, but they're also at 3.3. But Iowa, 3.8. Nebraska, 3.6. Kansas, 3.2. And you see, that's the Midwest is a cheap place to buy a house. Just something for you to know. It's the home price to index of income, and it's easy to figure out. It's an easy chart. So if you're thinking about buying a house, think of the state you live in. That's going to determine whether you can afford to buy a house 
So maybe living in the Midwest ain't all that bad. They may call us flyover country, but it's a lot cheaper to live here than it is to live on the left coast or the right coast. Just saying, something to think about. Well, if you've been watching the case of the Menendez brothers who were, well, put in jail supposedly for the rest of their lives for the shotgun killing of their mother and father, it's not in California, of course. Well, you probably heard that the uh, district attorney in Los Angeles, well, he wanted to have their sentence uh, uh, reduced, time served so they could get out on parole or whatever he wanted to do. His name was George Gascon. And this was his Hail Mary in the election, pre-election, to hopefully get people to vote for him. Didn't work. He was voted out of office, finally. So the governor of California, Governor Newsom, has decided, well, I'm going to decide what to do with the Menendez brothers, but I'm going to hold my uh, decision until the new district attorney, his name is Nathan Hockman, uh, gets into office and thoroughly reviews the case and decides... Uh, how he's going to handle this case. Now, doesn't matter how he's going to handle the case, folks. Doesn't matter one iota. The only thing matters is what the governor decides he's going to do, and he's going to do whatever he thinks is going to keep him in office, going to keep him being uh, the governor of the state of California until such time, and I'm guessing 2029, when he is ready to run for President of the United States. Don't kid yourself. That's his plan. Now, the only other problem he's going to have with the plan is the governor of Pennsylvania, who's a young, charming, and uh, well-spoken, of course, is probably going to be running himself. So, so Gavin Newsom is just sitting there going, okay, what am I going to do with this thing of the Menendez brothers? Many people in California think, well, they should be, uh, they should be free that, that mommy and daddy were abusing them. Others are saying no. Uh, they got a fair trial. They were sentenced to life in prison. They've been in jail 30, what, over 30 years now. That, uh, hey, they're in there for a life sentence, and they deserve to serve the full sentence. Like I said, Gascon is trying to get him loose, save his uh, political life, but it didn't work. So the governor is now going to decide exactly how it should play out, who's going to win, who's going to lose, and will the DA in, Cal in Los Angeles have any say in the matter? He thinks he will, but I can tell you right now, it don't matter. The governor will ultimately make that decision because the governor wants to make sure he has control so it affects his political stance when he runs for president, like I said, in four years. Don't think he's running? Uh, you might be surprised because he's running. He wants to be El Duce. And this is one of his ways to figure out how he can do it. Just filling in on the perils of, well, perils of Los Angeles and perils of the California governor. In the world of sports, and especially in the world of gymnastics, probably the best known name in the history was Bella Caroli. Well, Bella Caroli was 82 years of age when he passed away this weekend, and he was monumental. Now, here was a guy who coached uh, the, the Russian athletes. He was out of Romania, Nam, Ma, Na, Nadia Kobanich, not easy to say. And he, uh, he brought her to stardom back in, the, uh, back in the 70s, scored incredibly at the Olympics. But ultimately... Uh, well, he and his wife defected to the United States in the early 1980s. And then, for the next 30 years, he became the guiding force for American gymnastics. I mean, he was the guy who directed American gymnastics and let the United States have a gold standard gymnastics team in the Olympics. It uh, had the great people like, uh, oh, um, Kerry Strug, Mary Lou Retton, some of those names. The only reason I know all about this is obviously is that I'm still involved with the, with the uh, gymnastics. When my daughters were both young many years ago, we had them in gymnastics. And uh, they were both in the gymnastics at, uh, at Turner's as well as uh, another uh, facility here in town. And Summit City, by the way. 
So they were in gymnastics from basically the time they were little till well, they got into high school and even continued gymnastics there. So they've been at it a long time, but they were under some great coaching. But one of the things we were able to do many years ago is Bella Caroli had a camp down in Houston, Texas. And if you wanted to send your kids to Bella, Bella's camp, you could do that. Well, one of my wife's friends, uh, she has daughters also that were in gymnastics, and she said, hey, I'll take them down. I'll be down there in Houston uh, with them at the camp, and uh, if you want to send your daughters, we all, we all go down together. Her girls and our girls went down, and yes, they went down to Houston and trained at Bella Caroli's camp. Plus, they got to know some of the Olympic champions and they have shirts and stuff and uh, signed autographs and all that stuff. And they, I remember they came back off the airplane we, when they landed in Fort Wayne singing a banana song, and I have no idea what it was. But ultimately, they became great gymnasts and ultimately became, well, big-time cheerleaders. I know that sounds weird, but in gymnastics and cheerleaders, trust me, it works. Because now in cheerleading, it's mostly gymnastics, aside from cheering. But Bella Caroli. Passed away at the age of 82, no, uh, no cause was given, but he was one heck of a coach, and the society has lost a great, great coach, in my humble opinion. You know, a lot of folks have asked me since I started doing these podcasts, what is that thing that's hanging on the, on the chair behind me? Well, it happens to be a vest that I wear when I'm over at the rifle and pistol range for the Isaac Walton League. I happen to be an NRA certified range safety officer. Now, those are folks who are designed to be on, on gun ranges who are there for safety purposes. They're like the safety officer. And they have to be certified and, uh, and well taught on this thing to understand all the safety rules and protocols that exist. And in our particular Isaac Walton range, there is always an NRA certified safety officer on hand at all times. Now, this is why I wear this vest, because it lets people know that's who I am so we can assist people with any problems that come up and keeping the range safe. And speaking of gun safety, you know one of the latest things going on, a lot of people don't realize this, is one of the fastest growing sports in the United States for kids, high school kids, is trap and skeet shooting. I find that hard to believe, but actually it's a big deal. It's in 34 states. High schools have the, the, uh, their teams all over the place. Here at our range, at Isaac Walton, we have high school teams that are shooting on our range. And these are kids that come out, and they all get to participate. You know, in baseball or football or basketball, there's always kids riding this pint, let's be honest. Not in trap and skeet shooting. Everybody shoots. You're shooting at 25 targets. Who gets the best score? They are the winners. They're the leaders. So everybody shoots in trap and ski. If your school doesn't have a, a, a team like this, you might look into it. There are teams right here in Fort Wayne at various high schools, and they enjoy what they're doing. These kids learn and understand shooting sports and the safety that goes with it. So something to think about in today's world because, well, more and more people are getting into shooting. And in the case of this, this is something the kids really enjoy. And we've seen a number of kids move on to colleges. We have one young lady in our chapter who is now on a four-year full-ride scholarship to Georgia Southern University, and she is on their rifle team. She, you heard me right, it's a female four-year full scholarship. That's a pretty big deal. When a kid learns to shoot, this is something they can utilize because teams or colleges all across the nation, and I mean all across the nation, have rifle and pistol teams. It is a sport where everybody participates. So we've got a young lady in our, in our chapter. She's now a four-year ride student at a great university, and she's having the time of her life. So think about it. Biggest American sport going on right now for kids in high school is trap and skeet shooting. And there's clay organizations all around that exist. So if you'd like to see your son or daughter, because other one can shoot, it doesn't matter. It has no bearing on whether you're a boy or a girl. It's about the ability to to shoot 25 clay targets out of the air. Pretty simple thought when you think about it, but kids love it, and they build up a friendship and a, uh, an ability to deal with one another, and it's a team. That's what it is. So if you're thinking about something to do for your son or daughter, 
you might want to think about the fastest growing sport in the USA today with 34 states having trap and skeet teams at their schools. Something to think about and it might be something for your kid to really get involved and have a really great time and learn a whole lot about safety because that's what this is all about. And now you know what's going on at the Isaac Walton League right here in Fort Wayne, Indiana. What do you say we spend a few minutes talking about the art of war? Not a good topic to discuss, but let's be honest. As kids, we watched all the war movies with John Wayne and Burt Lancaster and uh, Kirk Douglas and you name it. Watched all those World War II movies. There were the John Wayne movies. There were the uh, Kirk Douglas movies. I can name a bunch of them. Even going back to World War I type movies, Gary Cooper stuff. Well, the art of war, folks, has changed. Now, we've all seen what happens in Vietnam. You saw what was happening in Iraq and Kuwait. Well, things are different, way different. Ukraine is the perfect example where everything's being tested out, and the biggest thing they're testing out in Ukraine are drones. Not the kind of drones you think about. Yes, we have those super drones that are big as airplanes, the, the giant Reaper drones and what have you, Predator drones that got you know Hellfire missiles on them. Those can loiter for hours, but there's a guy in another city in another country Flying the drone, he's just sitting in a room and he's looking down the TV. All right, that's fine. Now we've got new drones. The drones we're testing and utilizing in places like the Ukraine are small little tiny drones. Matter of fact, the government just placed an order for nearly 6,000 drones. Special drone packets that a guy puts in his backpack, a soldier does. He's got a controller and two drones that he has. And he gets to play with those just like he played video games at his house when he was a kid, playing with the drones. The kids know how to use those things. That's what's being used over in Ukraine by both sides. Both sides are using them. Drones are showing up everywhere. And now the United States is also trying to figure out, how do we take down drones? So we have these guns. You may have seen them on TV in certain uh, stadiums. Guy yeah, looks like he's got a Star Wars gun, and it breaks the signal on a drone, and the drone lands. They can pick it up. See where it's coming from. This is what we're working on, folks. We just uh, authorized $275 million more money for Ukraine. And a lot of that money went for drones. Because now you don't need to shoot a big giant cannon. You don't need to go over and drop a bomb. You just get a drone, put a uh, model explosive on it. You got suicide drones, kamikaze drones, different sizes. You got little tiny ones, little bitty ones, packed with C4. Hit you in the head. Boom, you're dead. Technology is changing, folks. We've gone to Star Wars. I hate to say it, but we are there. And what we are doing is we are telling people, all right, you want to have war? Here's how we're going to do it. We got our drones. You got your drones. That's all we're doing now. You don't need to fly a satellite over them. Just have a guy go up with his drone. Hey, private, take the drone up and go see what's going on over there. That's what we're doing. That's how technology has changed. That's what's being done in places like the Ukraine, testing out our capabilities, and they're testing out theirs. Because the wars of the future are going to be fought like you see in the movie Star Wars. Only this time, they're going to be using drones, deadly drones, that can kill even a person, and you won't even see it coming. That's what's going on, folks. Not a pleasant story, but you want the truth? Now you're getting the truth. That's all I got. Well, we all remember the rhetoric that came out of the presidential contest we just went through. It was pretty ugly and pretty nasty, and things were said by people that you're going, I can't believe that person said that. Well, if you think it's over now, the election is over, it ain't. Turns out a Washington Post columnist by the name of Jennifer Rubin, she's now urging Democrats, her tribe, to change their message to say that Republicans want to kill your kids. I'm not kidding, folks. This is what she said. On her Tuesday installment of her podcast called uh, Jennifer Rubin's Green Room, uh, she said that Senate Republicans who acquiesce to the Donald Trump's cabinet nominees must pay, quote, 
a political price. She's very angry with who Trump is promoting in his cabinet. And here's what she wanted to say. Quote, people who are irresponsibly put dangerous, treasonous, unfit people in positions of authority are responsible not only for those people, but for all the horrors that will unfold. And she went on to say, quoting again, and Democrats better get started now in tracking these people, holding these people accountable, and making clear to ordinary voters who voted for what and who's responsible for that. Now, how's she going to do that? Well, in order to do that, she says, we can't talk in broad themes. We must boil it down to nuts and bolts. And you have to have something pithy. Pithy, she said. What does it mean to be pithy? How about, this is what she's saying, that this is what Democrats need to start saying. How about Republicans want to kill your kids? It's actually true. This is what she's spouting out. And then she went on to say, if you're going to oppose vaccinations, you're going to stop breakthrough medical research, if you're going to allow minors and all sorts of people to get semi-automatic weapons, which they will use to shoot up schools, well, then you're responsible for kids' health and death. Unfortunately, it has to be that simple and that direct, and it has to be said over and over again. This is a columnist from the Washington Post. This is what she's saying. She said, we have to accuse Republicans of killing kids. That's the mantra she wants to use based on the people that Donald Trump selected for his cabinet. And she said, giving children semi-automatic weapons? I don't know where the hell this woman is coming from. We don't do that. It ain't allowed. And you can't do that legally in any state that I know of. Giving kids, nah, don't get me started. And she just doesn't like what's going on. So she goes on her podcast and rails and rails and rails and said, we Democrats, we must be ugly. We must say Republicans want to kill your kids. That's the message she's promoting. Not that somebody's good or not that somebody has a better plan to offer, because it's all about policy, folks. Whether you like it or not, this particular election was about policy. What the person in charge plans to do about the issues that are bothering him. In this particular election, it had to do with inflation, cost of stuff, cost of fuel, cost of food, cost of, uh, cost of getting a mortgage. All those things, those were issues. Jennifer Rubin doesn't want to talk about that. She wants to say, Republicans want to kill your children. This is why it's becoming really unfortunate, folks, and why elections have become ugly and sad. This is the way people want to talk and speak, and it's shameful. It's too bad America has to go through this. It really is. Happy.